there is a person, invisible to the human eye. He speaks, but in the form of a whisper. He's a helper, a teacher, and a counselor. He even prays for you. He grieves with you. He is ever present, always. He's often referred to as a ghost or a spirit, but a holy one. To put it simply, he is the Lord, the giver of life. Good morning, Hope. That was something. Whew. Um, great to see you guys this morning. My name is Wes Peterson, and I am on the team here and have the privilege of teaching this morning. It is such an honor, and it's such a privilege to have you here. And we just launched into a new series last week. David Dwight started us off uh, talking about the Holy Spirit. The sermon series is called Life Giver because that's what the Holy Spirit does. And this morning, we get to pick up and really build off of what, one, in particular, one of the things he shared. So I'm not going to be able to go over all of it. If you want to tune in, jump online and check it out. But I want to pick up on this idea of entering into a relationship with the Holy Spirit is like three-dimensional. It's, it's him in us and us in him. And the Holy Spirit is a person he said that doesn't have arms and legs, but he's a person, and he's God, but he's invisible, and he's like the wind. So the question that we're going to wrestle with today is like, how do you have a relationship with an invisible wind person that's God that doesn't have arms and legs that I can't hear or see? How do you have a relationship? And that's what we're going to spend some time on and ask God to show us who he is so that we can know him more fully. So would you pray with me as we get started this morning? Father, wow. To worship you, to lift up your name with brothers and sisters above every other name is such a joy. Thank you for community. Thank you for the church. Thank you for your word. And I pray this morning that through the power of your spirit who is here and working in this moment, that our hearts would be softened, that our minds would be open to understand more fully who you are and how to have a relationship with your spirit. So Father, move and work in only a way that you can. So you get all the praise, you get all the glory, and you get all the honor. And we pray this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, amen. So a few years ago, we moved to Boone, North Carolina. Any people been to Boone? Any Boonies? All right. So when we picked out our home, one of the things that made me extremely excited is that all of the trees on my property were evergreens. Because I was thinking about the fall. And I was thinking, if I have evergreens on my property, I don't have to rake leaves. And that makes me excited. So um, sure enough, fall started to approach. And what happened was I found a few leaves in my yard. And I was a little uh, frustrated. But I thought, there's just a few, so here's the plan. I'm gonna get out the mower, even though I thought I was you know, gonna have to put it away for the winter. I'm gonna get it out again, and I'm just gonna mow all the leaves, mulch them up into tiny little pieces, and then I can forget about it, then they're gone. So that worked for about a couple days, and then what happened is my yard was so full of leaves, I could not mow it, and I really did not wanna rake it. And I knew I had a problem, because I did not have a plan of how to solve a leaf problem, because I didn't think I was gonna have one. So I went to my neighbor and I said, hey, um, you know, we're new here and never done a, a fall here. So help me understand, how do I get the leaves out of my yard? How does this work? And he said, oh, Wes, it's so easy. What happens is a truck comes by with a big vacuum sucker on it and it, he comes right along the edge between the grass and the asphalt of the road and he sucks up all the leaves. And did you know what? I said, tell me. He said, 
on Monday, this was like a Friday, on Monday, the truck is coming. I thought, well, this is perfect, because on Saturday, I don't have to go to work. I'll get all the kids out, and we'll rake all the leaves down to the edge, and I will have all my leaves gone. So I got all my kids out on Saturday morning, said, okay, guys, let's go. Um, They all got rakes, and we proceeded to bring all, almost all of the leaves from the yard down to the edge, and there's a huge pile. Little jumping into the leaves happened, but this huge pile of leaves in, in the evening, and I was excited. And then I woke up the next morning and noticed that there was no pile of leaves at the edge of my yard anymore, a breeze came along and blew all, I wouldn't call it a breeze, it was like a tornado, I don't know. It came along and blew all of those leaves back into the yard where they were the day before after our hours of work. And you know, you have the, I don't know about you, but I have this thought process of like, I have evergreens, where are these leaves coming from? They're not really mine, they're my neighbors, they should come get them out of my yard. You know, this whole thing, my kids, let me get the kids back out again. But I was so frustrated and like torqued up inside, I just grabbed my rake and went out and just started like raking. And And when I would rake, I noticed that this breeze was still happening and and I would rake one time and then the wind would blow it all back. So I'm like raking harder. I'm like, And, and then after a while, I'm a little slow, but after a while I thought, wait a second, what would happen if I actually started raking with the wind? This is interesting. So I flipped the rake around and I raked. And for every one time I raked, like two piles of leaves move forward. I'm like, I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going to keep doing this. And I just kept raking and raking. And in the end, all of the leaves ended up like on the backside of my house in a really huge, massive pile that I then had to bundle up and, you know, throw away. I didn't get to put them in the leaf sucker. But I also didn't have to get frustrated. I didn't have to get mad at my kids. And it was so much easier. It was really so much easier. So the question, the idea that we're going to be wrestling with this morning is, are we willing, are are we ready to let the Holy Spirit guide our lives? Are you ready to let the Holy Spirit guide your life? If you have your Bibles with you, Open to Galatians 5. If not, it's going to be on the screen. And we're going to start in verse 16 as Paul tries to explain to the church what it looks like to let the Holy Spirit guide our life. And we're going to dive into this together. Verse 16 says, So I say, this is Paul speaking to the church, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. If you're writing something down, it's four words. Let the Holy Spirit, that's five, guide your life. Let the Holy Spirit guide. How many is that? Five. Let the Holy Spirit guide. This is what he says. Then you won't be doing what your sinful nature craves. The sinful nature wants you to do evil, which is just the opposite of what the Spirit wants. And the Spirit gives us desires that are opposite of what the sinful nature desires. There are two forces constantly fighting each other. So you are not free to carry out your good intentions. But when you are directed by the Spirit, you are not under obligation to the law of Moses. And we're not going to tackle that one today. We'll save that for later. Verse 19. When you follow the desires of your sinful nature, the results are very clear. Sexual immorality, impurity, lustful pleasures, idolatry, sorcery, hostility, quarreling, jealousy, outbursts of anger, selfish ambition, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, wild parties, and other sins like these. Let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. But... The Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against these 
things. So Paul is telling the church, he's telling you and me, that we have a choice to make. We have a choice to make between this inner tension in each one of us between our sinful nature and the Holy Spirit and what the Holy Spirit desires for us. And he starts off by saying, let the Holy Spirit guide you. Like, like this is going to be a really good thing for you if you let the Holy Spirit guide you. It's going to work out well for you if you let the Holy Spirit guide because he knows, Paul knows, that there's a tension. You, both you and me feel this constant tension, this fighting, this wrestling between these two options, these two what seem like fairly good ideas. This battle wages on in our hearts every day, every moment. It's a constant battle, a constant tension that we are wrestling through. Which one are we going to choose? Are we going to choose to let the Holy Spirit guide? Or are we going to choose to let our sinful nature guide? So this idea of a sinful nature, we all have it. Every single one of us has a sinful nature. Apart from Christ, we are dead in our sin. That's what scripture says. Not like partially dead, not like partially alive, like dead totally dead apart from Christ. So our, our, from that place of death, our mind and our heart gravitate to the things that are normal. And what's normal for dead people, that spiritually dead people, are these things. These things that, I'm gonna leave them up on the screen, I'm not gonna read them again, but they, this is where we end up if we allow our sinful nature to lead and drive us. Now, a little bit of tension here because Paul is talking to the church. He's talking to brothers and sisters who have given their life to Jesus Christ. So, it's, so this idea of this tension between what is right and what is wrong, what the Holy Spirit is leading us to do and what is wrong is still something that is familiar and is still an experience that the church has to wrestle through. It's still something that they are experiencing this battle with. And for me, when I'm with my kids and, and I'm looking at a potential choice that they're going to make, and I know what that choice is going to lead to, I like to try to help them understand what are the consequences of that choice. So Paul is saying, guys, if, if you, as brothers and sisters in Christ, choose the sinful nature, this is the fruit. These are the consequences. This is what comes when you choose the sinful nature. Now, I don't think I would like to assume that all of you look at that list and go, that's pretty yucky. I, I hope you're not like, oh man, I would love to get better at that, Wes. If I could just get a little bit better at that thing, I would be, I know I would fix all my problems. And see, the reason why there's a battle is because for some reason in our mind, we think that if we choose the sinful nature path, it's somehow going to work out. Like, it wouldn't be a battle if we knew that that's what was going to happen. But the battle rages on because we think that that's really not going to happen to me. That those kinds of outcomes, that kind of fruit is not going to be what happens to me. Somehow it's going to work out better. And this is even true for people who are followers of Jesus Christ. We've said, yeah, I wanna follow Jesus. I wanna follow him. I'm gonna, I'm gonna surrender my life to him. I'm gonna give him my life, except for this area. Except I'm not gonna forgive this person because, man, they deserve it. I'm not gonna do this thing that would be right because I really wanna do it my way. And we hold on to things because we think it's somehow going to work out better for us. And so in verse 21, it ends with this idea. He says, let me tell you again, as I have before, that anyone living that sort of life will not inherit the kingdom of God. What's he saying? Is he saying that if you are a Christ follower and you sin, you are separated from God and you're separated from your, a relationship with God? The answer is no. He's saying, if you live this life, and, and the best way I can wrap my head around it is like, have you ever, you know the difference between test driving a car and buying a car, right? If you buy a car, you're like, 
you, whatever calculations you've gone through in your head, this is right for my family, this is the right gas mileage, this has the right whatever, it's the right color, it's right. And you, you basically have said, I want this car to be a part of my life and this is how we're gonna do, this is how we're gonna do things. Versus the test drive is like you saying, okay, I really don't know if this is gonna work, I don't know if this is how I wanna do it, but I'm gonna go take it for a spin. I'm gonna, see, I'm gonna see if this one is actually better for me or not. And I think we as Christ followers often will do the test drive. We're like, okay, I know I have a car at home, but I'm gonna take this one for a spin. I'm gonna see what happens. I'm gonna follow my sinful nature and I'm gonna see what happens on this, on this trip. I'm gonna see if I like this thing and if it works out for me. And I think there's people in this room this morning who are test driving things that God is asking you to turn in the keys for. Because you've justified it, you've rationalized it, you said, I'm gonna hang on to this God, this is okay for me to do, I'm I'm gonna manage this issue in my life and everything's gonna be fine and because he loves you, because the Holy Spirit is God and God is love, the Holy Spirit is saying, no, no, I love you too much to let you keep test driving this car that's gonna wreck your life. So give me the keys. He loves you. The Holy Spirit wants to bring life. He knows what you need. Because this is what he produces. Verse 22. But the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, Doesn't that just sound good? Goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. The Holy Spirit is working to call you and me to choose to follow him, to be our guide, because he is leading us to life. He is leading us to the thing that we want the most, Because you may be sitting in this room and going, Wes, I really need is peace. And I think my way to peace is this. And the Holy Spirit is going, no, it's not. It's me. You're like, well, what I really want is that I I really want my husband to be faithful. How are you going to do that? The Holy Spirit is the one who makes people faithful. The Holy Spirit is where the life, abundant life is. It's not found in us. It's not found in you and me. Remember, I said we are, apart from Christ, we are dead. So this is not a list of things that we produce by ourselves. This is something that when we say yes to the Holy Spirit, when we let the Holy Spirit guide us, he produces it in us. We don't manufacture it. And here's why. Earlier on in Galatians chapter five, uh, chapter 5, verses 13 through 15, he says this, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. For the whole law can be summed up in this one command. Love your neighbor as yourself. But if you are always biting and devouring one another, watch out. Beware of destroying one another. He's telling us this because the Holy Spirit is attempting and moving us into a place where we can love him, know him, and love each other really well. Sometimes we're all biting each other. It's a mess. When we choose our selfish ambition, it's not just destructive for me, it impacts the people that I'm around. That morning when I was raking leaves, I was frustrated. I was upset. And I was about to make my kids' life miserable too. So I'm like, come on, kids, let's do it again. Get out here. And that's what happens when we choose sinful nature. It impacts us and we end up biting each other. We end up mean to each other. We end up destroying each other. And the Holy Spirit is like, no, no, that is not life. There's another option but you have to follow me. You have to yield your life to me, the Holy Spirit, as a guide. There's no other way to do it. 
You can't make, you cannot produce the fruit of the Spirit by yourself. You can't do it. You have to let him guide you. And when you do, then the fruit is produced. A couple years ago, I went to a friend's house. And um, when I walked in, the home just automatically felt homey. Like, you know people who have the gift of hospitality and you just feel like you're in your living room in two seconds? Well, like this family had it. I just felt like I could kick my shoes off, grab the remote and watch golf and like everything would have been fine. And so as we're talking in, in a little bit, they're like, hey, do you need anything to drink or eat? And I was like, you know, I'll take some water. And their response was, oh, well, you're at home, so just get whatever you need. I'm like, I like these people. So I'm, you know, going through the cabinets, looking around, looking for stuff. I find my glass, and I'm going to the sink to get some water. And as I'm filling it up, I I look over, and to my right is a basket of fruit. So I'm like, you know, I'm kind of hungry, and I feel at home. So I'm, I'm in the process, filling up my cup and reaching over to grab the fruit while I'm saying to the couple, hey, guys, um, can I have this apple? And something changed in the room. It went from being a homey, friendly, do whatever you want to like, I just crossed over something bad. Because they both like looked and started to look at each other and say something while I'm grabbing. And, and, and I'm thinking in my head, well, maybe you're going to like make an apple pie later and I'm messing up their whole plan. Maybe it's rotten. May, like I, I'm racing through what could be happening in this moment. And at the same time as I'm like lifting this piece of fruit up from the bowl, they say, it's not real. <laughs> And I'm like, oh, you're right. Um, the, fake fruit has gotten really realistic. I don't know if you've noticed this, but it's gotten a lot better. And so I'm like putting the, the fruit down and they're like, and I'm like, sorry guys. And like, what else do you want? And that kind of thing, we worked through it. But my point is because the Holy Spirit is the only one that can produce fruit, sometimes what we like to do is we like to make our own fake fruit and then we get some duct tape and we tape it to the tree of our life so that people think we're producing fruit from the spirit, but it's really not. And they go to grab it and they're like, yeah, that's not real. And you're like, yeah, I know it's not real. And see, what happens is we end up trying to manufacture something that only the spirit can do. And the spirit knows it. The Holy Spirit is not tricked. He knows it's fake fruit. And to be honest with you, the people around you actually know it too. And maybe we don't get enough time with you in that space of your life to tell if it's fake or not. But what happens to us just because we are human is we end up not being kind. We end up not being loving. We end up not being gracious and faithful. And so you, you can't hide it. You cannot hide who you are. You also can't make it happen. So what can we do? What we can do is what Paul said, let the Holy Spirit guide your life. But whenever you give people like us a list of do's and don'ts or right and wrongs, we mess it up. This is what John Piper says. He says, but there's a great danger in giving morally depraved people like us a list of right, and, right things and wrong things. The danger is that instead of seeking transformation from God in our hearts to rid ourselves of depravity, we may take the list of virtues and find a way to use them to express our depravity. Let me translate. Some of you are sitting in this room and you saw the list of sins and you're like, huh, mine's not in there. I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. And and some of you are looking through the list of the fruit of the Spirit, and you're like, hmm, well, I'm really good at that one. Maybe, maybe not that one, but oh, that one I'm really good at. You should have seen me yesterday. And both of those are a form of self-righteousness. It's you admitting to yourself that you do not understand that you are dead without Christ, and that anything good in you, anything good from you is 100% the work of the Holy Spirit. 
So if you're playing a game this morning where you're like, hey, Wes, you know what? I, I'm gonna take the, this thing for a test drive because I really think it's gonna work for me. Read the list again. That's, that's what's gonna happen. And if you're like, well, Wes, I'm, I'm really doing good on producing this fruit in my life and, and I'm doing a pretty good job. Let me tell you, if it's fake, we and God all know it. So just go ahead and cut it off and let's get back to the basics. We are dead without Christ. So if you want to know the Holy Spirit, if you want to know the person of the Holy Spirit, you have to let him guide you. You have to. There's no, there's no shortcut. There's no bypass. And when you do, when you let the Holy Spirit guide you, the abundant life that he offers is so amazing. It tastes so good. When you meet someone who is loving, like really lo sacrificially loving, when you meet someone who's kind and gracious and faithful, it's like, what is that? That is beautiful. That is amazing. And it's not because they're amazing. It's because God's amazing and he's working in them to produce that fruit. So this morning, you and I have an invitation because we're all raking leaves, people. Nobody here has it figured out. We are all in a battle, a constant battle that keeps going on. It's not a one and done. So we're in it. The question is, which way are you gonna rake your leaves? Are you gonna rake them in the direction where it's like, hey, my sinful nature feels pretty good and I really think this is gonna work out for me, Wes. You really don't understand. It's gonna be phenomenal. Let me tell you, the wind is not blowing that direction. That's not the way life works. As our Father is telling us because he loves us, don't do it. It doesn't work. Or are you gonna choose to move in step with and live surrendered and yielded in this three-dimensional relationship with the Holy Spirit and rake with him? And as you do, you go, oh, this is fun. I mean, it's kind of still hard. I still have to pick up leaves. But like, this works. Like, I'm able to love people well. I'm, I, I'm able to experience joy and peace and patience and goodness and faithfulness and gentleness and self-control in ways that I could never do on my own. And you're like, yeah, that's how it works. That's what happens when you know and you're in relationship with the Holy Spirit. So the question is, which way are you gonna rake your leaves? So as we close this morning, I'm gonna give you a chance to pray. And the prayer is a pretty simple one, guys. It's not complex. It's a prayer of saying, I, Lord, am gonna let you guide me. I'm gonna let you guide. I'm not gonna do it my way. I'm gonna let you guide. And for, for some of us, we have to turn in the keys of our, of our cars that we're test driving. And we're saying this, Lord, I, I've tried this and it's not working. I'm gonna give it to you. And let the Holy Spirit take over and let him guide. For some of us, we need to get rid of some fake fruit. We thought we were producing this stuff on our own and you're tired, you're exhausted, it's not working. And you just say, Lord, I'm gonna let go. I'm gonna let go of an image that I'm trying to create in this community with a spouse or friends or some place in our church and you're trying to keep up this image that's not real and it's exhausting. And God's saying, I can handle it. I got it, just follow me and I'll do it for you. So he's inviting you to join him. The direction, the way that the Holy Spirit is blowing in life. The other thing I wanna challenge you to is to do some homework. Sorry, kids. But to do some homework because this idea of fruit of the Spirit is important. It's important to understand what they are and how it works. And here's my challenge. My challenge is to memorize them. And then my second challenge, if you want extra credit, is to study them. Because when we read the word love, Spirit produces these kinds of fruit. Love, joy. We are like love. Well, I love chocolate. Is that what it's talking about? And the answer is no, it's not talking about that kind of love. So what is it talking about? How do we experience the love of the Holy Spirit? Well, little clue here. In John 3, 16, it says, for God so loved the world that he sent his only son. That's the same love that it talks about here. 
Meaning, the love that we're talking about is not something that makes, makes you feel good and something that you enjoy. What it's talking about is a sacrificial, pouring out, making others a priority over yourself kind of life. That's what it's talking about. And so my encouragement to you is to do some homework. Take a look at these fruit and say, what is this? What, what is happening here that only can be done through the power of the Holy Spirit? Because as you do, as you say yes to let him guide you, and as you understand what he's doing, your ability to know him personally goes up exponentially high. It's the only way to know him. It's the only way to grow in him. Would you pray with me? Father, we want you. We want what is good and right and pure and lovely. But you know that we are in a battle. You know that we are constantly battling. We don't do what we should do and we do do what we shouldn't do and the tension is, is real. And out of your grace and out of your mercy on us, you've given us your spirit who calls us, invites us to follow him as our guide. And this morning, Father, there may be someone in here who's been trying to figure life out by doing it their own way, and it's not working. Pray that you would give them the courage and the boldness to say, Lord, you're in charge. I wanna follow you. There may be others in here who have tried to produce fake fruit on their own and sell it off as real and forgive us, Lord. Bring healing and repentance through your spirit so that what is produced, what is lived out of us is from your spirit, is genuine, is pure. So, so that your church can accomplish the work that you've called us to so that we can glorify you, so that we're not hurting each other and living in disunity, so that your name is lifted up and exalted. Father, do a work in us through the power of your spirit because that's all we've got. We can't do it ourselves. So we lay our hearts, we lay ourselves at your feet and ask you to move and work through the power of your spirit. And we pray this in Jesus' name, amen.